Well, welcome if you're tuning in online. Welcome everyone here. Who are we, we're missing? <clears throat> we're missing some of our normal people. I wonder if Linda will join us today. Powers. He has no. Pardon? Pardon? What? Do you, do you know if Linda will be joining us today? Linda I think it all depends on how fast her bowling goes. Yeah, like oh, she comes like after that. bowling. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. She gets a lot of strikes, and she'll be here sooner. Because <laughs> it takes, it goes faster if you roll strikes. You don't <laughs> yeah. have to do a second and roll. Also, it's going fast because they only have two or three people. Yeah. Oh. You know, and the two teams, one and two. I would, I'd love to do a bowling league. I love to bowl. We have Linda Smalling is with us, and looks like Patty Bloomquist is on. Hello, ladies. We're gonna wait another minute or two and see okay. if Linda shows up, or Kitty sometimes comes. Yeah. I don't know if she'll oh, be it's good to have her come today. The other day. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll finish Romans for sure, and then I think we may. Uh, and Tom's with us too. It's Linda says it's both of them, and we'll finish Romans, and we'll begin Proverbs. That was what we decided last week. Yeah, yeah. Unless somebody has changed their mind strongly, we'll we'll start Proverbs today, and we'll go pretty quick. As I told you, there's 30, 31 or thirty two chapters in Proverbs, but they're pretty repetitive. Uh -huh. There's three sections. Well, I'll get to that. I'll explain the sections and how it's broken down once we start. But let's let's get Romans done first. I think we can go ahead and start. I don't see anybody pulling up, so let's start with a word of prayer. Okay. Lord, we give you thanks for gathering us. We give you thanks for being able to come together, even online. And we pray that you would guide us through the book of Romans, help us to understand what you would have us take away and what you would have us apply to our lives from this letter written by Paul 2,000 years ago. May he teach us the ways of God and the ways of grace. May these words strengthen our faith and guide us in how we live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, um, we're, we're, no, we didn't do fourteen, did we? The day. No, I think the day. day. Oh, we, no, I don't know. Did we do fourteen? I had. I, I, I had something on. Uh, I wrote down fifteen and fifteen and fifteen. <laughs> I don't know if we started. Oh no. I don't think we did 14, so I'm going to do it. Okay. My notes tell me I thought I did. <laughs> so here Paul is doing what he does in a lot of his letters, which is giving advice on how Christians should get along because Christians are like children, and they're always bickering and fighting over nonsense, usually. Usually nonsense. Uh -huh. um, is what they fight over and argue over and nothing has changed in 2,000 years <laughs> Christians are still children who fight over nonsense and so Paul is giving them advice um, and he he's telling those who are strong to put up with those who are weak and of course everybody always thinks they're the strong and the other people are the weak so but that works fine for Paul's purposes because his point is if you're if you're strong and you think you're strong, in other words, if you're right and you think you're right, then you should be patient and you should give allowances and you should make compromises, he says, with those who are weak. So accept him whose faith is weak. And in this case, who are the who are those whose faith are weak? Well, they're the ones who say that you shouldn't eat meat and you shouldn't eat things and you th those who still want to keep some of the Jewish laws those are the ones that he's saying are weak. So he says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Oh, we did talk about that. Remember disputable matters and then we talked about what's disputable. So maybe we did do this. And we even, as we said, argue over what's disputable and what isn't. <laughs> so we dispute about, over everything. But you mentioned that as a guide, we can use our, our uh, creed. 
creeds. Yes, as a guide, we can use our creeds because what's in the creeds is what's not disputable. And if it's not in the creeds, then maybe it is disputable. Or it's, but if it's in the if it's in the creeds, it's not disputable. Uh -huh. I mean, you can. I think that's you can have some certainty there. Okay, so we did read that. Um, let's then let's move on to fifteen. Because I, I think I realizing I'm wrong Ooh, and that we did no, 14. So let's do 15. Okay. And it, he says the same thing. 15 begins the same way as 14. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. And this is a very simple concept. It's very hard to apply in the church. And you could even though you could even apply this in your families and you probably should apply it to your families. When you have a dispute or an argument with somebody in church or somebody in your family, this would be a rule to put into place. In other words, you should be trying to please the other person. And so I use this as an example because it's so common, but we argue over music, don't we? Yeah. We have disputes over music. We don't follow this. Because what happens when we argue about music is people who like one kind of music demand their kind. And the people who like the other kind of music demand that kind. Somebody do it all. But, but what Paul is saying here is that the way it should be, the way it should be is some of, these, some of these traditionalists who like the hymns, they should be saying, you know what? I want more praise music. Because I why? Because we shouldn't be out to please ourselves. We shouldn't be fighting for what makes us happy. We should be fighting for what makes the other person happy. And then the person who likes the modern praise music should come in and bang their fist on the table and say, We should have more organ music and more hymns. Right? Because the mindset, according to Paul, that a Christian should have is that you argue or that you fight for the what the other person wants not for what you want. But how often do we do that? Not very often. But that's the ideal. That's what Paul's saying. You should be patient with the other person and not be out to get what you want. Not out to please yourself. Because it's not what, the church is not about what you want, is it? Each of us, verse 2, should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. In other words, we, your, your priority should be you know, I want what will help my brother. Yes, in their walk. In their walk. I, so if I have people, so if I love organ music and traditional hymns, but I know that someone else in the congregation is really spiritually encouraged by praise music, I should be paying attention to that, and that's what I should care about. Right? And it, this doesn't, I mean, it's not just music. This could apply to anything. It could be programs, right? Yeah. It could be programs. I don't have any children. Let's, I mean, I do, but let's pretend I don't have any children. But I know that, that there's families in this church that do have children. Yeah. So even though I don't have children, and those Would programs for children late. don't benefit me. Did you win? No. Okay. Hi, Linda. Linda's joining us from bowling. We know if you're late, we know you didn't bowl a lot of strikes. <laughs> the pin setter kept quitting. They finally had to oh, stop no. and rebooted. <laughs> That's a bummer. That's annoying when the pin setter doesn't work. Okay, well, we're in Romans 15, and we're just in chapter 2, <laughs> so you haven't missed much. And we're talking about how when we have, because Paul is talking about disputes in the church, arguments, divisions, factions, and Paul's saying the way it should work is that everyone should be out for their other person's sake, not for their own. And so I was just using some examples about music. Um... And we should, the way it really should be is that we should be wanting the music that benefits our brother or sister, not what we like. Or, I said programs. If, let's say, you don't have kids, so the children's programs don't benefit you. But you shouldn't be concerned just for yourself. You should be concerned for those parents and those kids. So, in other words, in the church, you're supposed to put the other, pers the other party's interests ahead of your own interests. And that's 
we do. I think we we do, we struggle to do that with music. <laughs> In my experience, most most people want the music they like, but we do a pretty good job when this comes to programs because we got a lot of folks here. Some of you don't have kids that are involved in church, but you support the children's programming. Yeah. You volunteer to, to do things to help yeah. the kids' programs. Um, even though your kids may not, maybe your kids are grown and gone, and your grandkids don't go here, but you still support the youth ministry. Because again, we're not here just for ourselves. Our priority, as Paul says, should be what will build up and encourage and support the others. And then, he, and then he says here, you know why? You know why Christians should be like that? Well, here's why. For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the quote there that Jesus took the suffering that belonged to us Right? So Jesus didn't seek after his own interests. So we should do the same. And then he says, this is a good, he jumps here, to talk, he's talking about the Old Testament. For everything that was written in the past, that means in the Old Testament, that's what he's talking about. Everything that was written in the Old Testament was written to teach us. So the Old Testament is written for, for you, to teach you. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the scriptures, the Old Testament is there for you to read to give you hope and strength. And that's, uh, I have to make this point, and that, that ties into our sermon from last week. Remember Psalm 22? Psalm 22 begins in despair. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it, I said in the sermon, it moves out of despair towards hope. And how does it do it? Well, the turning point comes about five verses in when David says but then I remember God's faithfulness in the past so that's the same thing Paul is saying here that you look to the past you read the stories of the Old Testament and how God was faithful to lead and teach and guide and save in the past and the memory of that, those things in the past do what? it brings you out of despair towards hope and that's, how, that's the, and that's the course Psalm 22 takes. Moves from despair to the memory of the past towards hope in the future. And that Paul gives that same outline right here. Verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. I've said this over and over again, but it's, Paul is always saying, get Along, And you missed it, Linda, but I was saying Paul writes in all of his letters to the churches, always has to give advice about how Christians can get along because Christians are like bickering children and they're constantly okay. fighting over dumb stuff. Yeah. And Paul, to every church he writes to, always has to talk about this. And that's just the nature of things is because we're human. But that you notice that when you really read Paul's letters, they're all, they all always, every single one of them, Galatians, Philippians, Ephesians, Thessalonians, Romans, Corinthians, say in one word or another, get along, figure it out, settle your differences, respect each other, put the other people first. You know, it's like, it's like a parent. It's like, I feel like this with my kids. Get along, stop taking each other's stuff. Stop being jerks to each other. That Paul is saying the same thing. So, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement, so the same God that gives you hope and that gives you faith, may that God also give you unity. So, or if you take hope from God, if you believe in God, well, then you, we pray that God will also give you the ability to get along. Give you a spirit of uni, um, unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How will you glorify God? By your unity. In other words, you, you want to change the world? Do you want to have a witness? Do you, do, you, do you watch the news and shake your head and think about how awful everything is? Okay, do you want to do something about it? Well, then do something about it by getting along in church. Show the world that in one spirit you worship one God. 
Because if the church can't even get along, <laughs> why should it even pay attention to? Uh, if the church isn't doing, in other words, church does. If the church doesn't have any more unity than Washington, why should anybody pay attention to us? Yeah. So it's important for our witness. If we want to have a valid witness in the world, we have to get along. Verse seven, again, accept one another, accept one another. Then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring, bring praise to God. And that's, you could, you could play it, you could preach a whole sermon on that, I think. Uh, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. You might have complaints about your brother or your sister, or you might have problems, right? But you weren't perfect. <laughs> You've got problems too, and Jesus accepted you. So if Jesus accepted you with your faults, then you need to accept your brother and sister with their faults. Verse 8, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. And you can see that the Jewish people are always on Paul's mind. He brings them up again here, and he says, Christ became, has become a servant to them. God is still pursuing the Jews, still trying to reach them. Why? Why is God still trying to reach the Jews? Why is God still serving the Jews according to this verse? The answer is right there. Why is Paul doing why is God doing that? Why is God still serving the Jews? To hold up the promise. To hold up right, that's right, Linda. Hold to be to hold up the because he promised. Right? God made promises to Abraham. And the Jews are Abraham's children. So the reason God is going to be faithful to the Jews because God promised he made promises to Abraham that he's got to keep and God keeps his promises verse 9 so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written and you see Paul, what Paul is doing here is subtle but he's he's talked about how you need to get along in church and how you need to accept each other and bear with each other and the big division in the church in his time was what? Between the Jews and the Gentiles. So he's moving towards saying the Jews and the Gentiles need to get along within the church. They need to find a way to accept each other. Because God has chosen to include them both. So that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Right? That's, and that's a key verse for Paul. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, which are the Jews. Right, So he, it, even in the Old Testament, it was predicted and prophesied and promised mm -hmm. that Jew and Gentile would one day come together as one. So you're going to get along. <laughs> it's kind of like the sermon I preached on the book of Revelation, where all the nations are going to come into the New Jerusalem. All races, all ethnicities, they're all going to live together as one family. So you better learn to like it now. This is going to happen one way or the other. Verse 12, uh, no, verse 11. Um, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. He's quoting the Old Testament here. He's quoting Psalm 69, uh, 2 Samuel twenty-two fifty, 50, Psalm 18. Uh, then he's going to quote Deuteronomy 32, and then he's going to quote Psalm 117. So he's... Paul's quoting all over the Old Testament here. Verse 12, again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse, what's the root of Jesse? I hope you, I hope you know that reference given the sermon series we just finished. David. David, that's right. Good job, Carla. David was the I son of, my, you've read your footnote, that's okay, I'll take it. David is the son of Jesse, right? So when the root of Jesse is David. The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. So we're talking about Jesus here because Jesus is a descendant of David who was a son of Jesse. And Jesus is that root that springs up who will rule over the nations. And Gentiles will hope in him. And that's what's happened. Paul is seeing the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The Old Testament said that a child of Jesse, a descendant of Jesse, will rule and that Gentiles 
will rejoice in him. And that's happened. Gentiles have come to rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ, who is a child of David, a child of Jesse. This has happened. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So these are encouraging words. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. Those are... Um, with two of the Advent themes. Well, they're actually three, aren't they? May the God, what, remember the Advent themes? What are the themes we do in Advent? Do you know the Advent candles? What are the Advent candles we light? Do you remember what they stand for? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the Christmas I know. Yeah. Well, they're, so they're not Chris, technically they're not Christmas. Before. They're Advent. Yeah. yeah. And there's four candles. Yeah. And they are, um, they are hope, joy, peace, and love. And then the center is the Christ candle. Yeah. And so Paul's naming three of those here. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the three, um, that's, that'd be the three purple candles. And pink is love. Verse 14. I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. And that's, um, you know, that the, I, the tone there, I imagine, is, is sort of the encouragement you give your child, right? Go, son, and take your test. I know you studied hard. Do well. Right? I'm convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. That's the goal. I hold this up to the church and the session often. It, it, you should be able to teach other people the Christian faith. That's what Paul is saying here. You should be able to teach. You should be able to do a basic Bible study with your kids, or with your grandkids, or with your neighbor, or anyone who wants to learn. That is that should be your goal. Where you should be wanting to get to. In other words, you don't. And I think Presbyterians need to hear that too because I think Presbyterians, a lot of them, you know, they come on Sunday and they think, well, I'll, I'll hear a good encouraging message so that I can feel better. But you, you should be shooting for a lot more than that. Your knowledge of the scriptures, your knowledge of God, your understanding of Christianity should be at a level where you could instruct others. And that's you know, where we have this idea of we make disciples who can make disciples, right? So you have to get to a point in your faith where you feel like you could take somebody off the street or whoever, whoever God puts in your life, right? Could be could be a member of your family, could be a stranger, could be a neighbor, I don't know. But where you, you know enough about Jesus and Christianity that you could take someone who said, hey, Linda, I want to be a Christian. Can you teach me? And the answer should be, yeah, I can, I can show you. You know, it doesn't mean you have to know everything. It doesn't mean you have to know Greek and Hebrew. It doesn't mean you, know, you don't have to answer every question. But you should know enough that you can give somebody the basics. And, and is it simplified? Is it basically the gospel is what you want to yeah. get across to them, the story of Jesus and more yeah. Sure. Again, you could even, I mean, a good guide would be the, the Apostles' the Creed. <laughs> could you explain someone the Apostles' Creed? You know, go, go through those. And again, it doesn't mean every, you don't have to know every answer to every question. But could you go through the Apostles' Creed kind of line by line and explain to somebody in simple layman's terms what it means? That would be a good, you know, if you can do that, you could, you could probably instruct somebody. So, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. I have written you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. There's lots of religious religion language there, religionese. He's saying, 
God has made me, God has sent me to the Gentiles. And I've brought the Gentiles the gospel. And so he's all saying that's sort of a, this is why I care. This is, I'm, I, I wrote you very passionately and I might have instructed you boldly, but that's because I feel like it's my responsibility to make sure that you hear and understand the gospel. And sometimes preachers, you know, I get fired up, I get, I might get passionate, I might get bold, I might even sound stern sometimes. The reason I sound that way is because it's my job to make sure that you hear and understand what really matters. That's kind of what Paul's saying. Verse 17, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. In other words, Paul saying, I have a narrow focus. I don't talk about anything but what Jesus has done. That's my message. One of my favorite verses is from, is from 1 Corinthians, but Paul says, I have resolved to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul's saying, I don't come talking to you about this and that and every other subject. I come and I talk to you about Jesus and him cru crucified. The focus is on Jesus and even narrower than that, on the cross of Jesus. That's the focus. Here Paul says simply Jesus. I, I came to talk about him. One of my favorite stories, I'm gonna t I'll tell it again because I like to tell it. I think it's, if you memorize it, if you get sick of it, I'll feel good that I've done my job. Um, what was his name? Well, he was, the story goes that the king of Sweden, and I can't remember his name, but the king of Sweden came to visit this church and he was a well-loved king and the pastor of the church was surprised the, the king made a surprise visit the pastor was so overwhelmed and just so full of adoration for the king that in his sermon the pastor just talked about how good the king was and all the things that he had accomplished what a good christian man he was and then the king left, and, and a couple weeks later, a gift arrived at the church from the king. And the pastor of the church opened up the box, and in it was a crucifix. And there was a note with the, crop, with the crucifix that said, attach this crucifix to the pillar that stands and faces the pulpit. So, you know, so, so the preacher could see it. And why? to remind whoever stands at the pulpit of his proper subject. <laughs> right? So the king was upset. The yeah. king did not want to hear a speech that told the king yeah. how great he was. Mm -hmm. The king has said, no, you put, you put this there to remind the pastor that he should be preaching about Christ and not about anything else. I love that story because it's very true. And that's what Paul's saying here. Um, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illy Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. And he's, he's a missionary. He's got a missionary spirit. He wants to take the message to people who haven't heard it. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, in other words, that he's not preaching to the choir, right? He wants to go out where nobody's heard of Jesus before and start a new church up from scratch. That's hard to do. You know, that's, that's the work of a church planter today, someone who starts a new church out of nothing. It's pretty tough to do. Or there's still places in the world where they really haven't heard about Jesus, and missionaries go there. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. Verse 23, But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. 
now, so he's saying, I plan to come visit you in person. He's still, and that's, we haven't talked about that yet, but Paul has never met any of these people. Everything he's written so far, he's written to people he's never seen face to face. And he's saying now, I'm, I'm hoping that one day I can come and sit down with you and be with you. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there from Macedonia and Achaia. We're pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And that's talked about both in First and Second Corinthians, where there was a famine in Israel, and Paul had asked the Gentile churches to give donations to buy food for the Christians who were starving in Jerusalem. And Paul, so Paul does some of his best stewardship work. Right? Paul knew how to talk to people to make them give, and there's some interesting passages in Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians, about that offering. But he's, he's collected this money and now he's going to bring it to Jerusalem. He says, I got to do that first. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. And that was Paul's argument, right? Because he went to the Jews and he said, I want you to give some money. He went to the Gentiles, sorry. Paul went to, in Greece, that's what Ikea means, Greece. So I went to Greece, and they, had, they were wealthy there, the Greeks had more money than they had in further east in the empire in Jerusalem and he said I want you to give money to help the people in Jerusalem who are starving I know you've never met them I know you don't know them but the gospel of Jesus came from them and so in a way you owe them you, you should take that's what Paul is saying anyway you should give to the Jews because it was out of them it was out of their culture and their civilization that the good news has come to you so after I have completed this task um, yeah um, for if the Gentiles have shared in so the Gentiles right shared in the Jews spiritual blessings that's been Paul's point is that Gentiles have now gotten the inheritance that belonged to the children of Abraham so if the Gentiles share the Jews' spiritual inheritance or blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I ur and then he gives some last parting advice. We're almost done. I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. So he asks now for their prayers. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. And of course he did. We, he did get to go to Rome. He was, he was killed there, but he did make it. He made it to Rome. Now, the last chapter is kind of a, a more, a very personable Paul looking forward to being with them, and he greets specific people. So we'll go through this pretty quickly. So chapter 16, verse 1. I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant, and the word there uh, is deacon. Deacon. I don't know if you knew that, but that's where we get the word deacon from, is here in Greek. So, I commend you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincrea, or Cincrea. I ask you to receive her and the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful for them. So Priscilla and Aquila were husband and wife, and they are leaders. So this is another example, you know, that later on the church, when it became more developed and more part of the Roman Empire, women were pushed out. But at the very beginning here, we can see that there were women who were leaders in the church. And it's notable that Paul puts Priscilla first, right? He doesn't say, he doesn't put the husband first, he puts the wife first. 
which tells us that she was an important woman. And that just, yeah, it's just historical evidence that God has, from the beginning, allowed women to lead in churches. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus, they risk their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. So this couple had a church meeting in their house. And remember, this is really early on, that the church, church, they didn't have churches, they didn't have buildings to meet in. They met in people's homes. So greet the church that meets in their house. Greet my friend, dear Ep Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are standing among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So Junia is a female, and, that, and she's listed as an apostle, which is what the highest authority, right? That's higher than a priest. That's higher than a pastor. That's higher than a, anything else. So again, we can see evidence that women held the absolute highest levels of authority in the very early church. Greet Ampliatus, whom I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. We don't know who a lot of these people are. Greet Apelles, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Again, all these women in positions of leadership. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother who has been a mother to me, too. Greet Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and brothers with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympos with the saints with them, and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Um, I can remember a funny story in my New Testament seminary class. We were talking about how you know, there's lots of commands in the Bible that we don't really follow anymore. I mean, there's things that we don't, some commands we keep and some commands we don't. And someone brought up this verse, which in verse 16, that's a command, right? And w many churches don't follow that command, right? We don't treat that, in other words, we don't treat that command as a universal command. All of us must do that. And then there was one young man in the class and there were some pretty girls in the class too and the young man said well I think we should keep this commandment we should be we should be greeting each other with a holy kiss and then one of the girls responded you better make it holy brother and it was just a funny little episode there so greet one another with a holy kiss As some cultures do this uh, I think Eastern European cultures do this they greet each other with kiss. my Sarah's family does it um, Sarah's family from India I mean they it's a it's a custom when they when they come together as a family Thanksgiving they, they often kiss each other on the cheek mm -hmm. um, it does you know gender ages matter Every, they do it they kiss each other verse 17 I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. So this is always a problem. There's always, first of all, divisions, people who cause trouble, and second of all, there's false teachers who spread nonsense and teach things that are bad. And they, um, yeah, smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I'm full of joy over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. So he warns them about people who cause division and people who spread false teaching. And he says, I, I have to say this because this is out there and I need you to be wary, right? For the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. 
Timothy, and there's a letter by his name in the New Testament. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my relatives. I, and here's where we get the idea that Paul wrote this, didn't actually write this with his own hand, but he probably dictated it. He was probably talking out loud, right? And that's why he kind of rambles sometimes or repeats himself or, or gets distracted because he was probably just speaking off the cuff. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. So we hear the name, the, the amanuensis, or whoever was taking dictation writes his greetings. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Cortus send you their greetings. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's all one sentence. Teacher marked that as a run-on. But it's beautiful. The, the God who establishes you in the gospel and the proclamation of Christ and the proclamation of Christ is what, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden, the mystery hidden is that Jesus is God and God is Jesus. But now revealed, right? The true nature of God has been revealed on the cross. It, um, and made known through the prophetic writings by the command. And that's right where the claim that I've, we've been preaching the sermon series that all the Old Testament secretly, if you know how to look for it, speaks of Jesus. Right? It's not, it doesn't use his name, maybe, but Jesus is there all throughout the Old Testament, hidden in images and types and figures. Jesus is talked about um, by the command of the eternal God so that all nations, all nations, might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's Romans. That's good. Okay. Well, we've got, I think we've got time to get started on uh, Proverbs. I'm going to do a short introduction. Proverbs, as you're turning to it, it should come, you should find it right after Psalms. Proverbs is, you know, what are Proverbs? Well, they're wisdom teachings. And the Jews divide the Bible in the Old Testament. When I say, from a Jewish perspective, the Bible is the Old Testament. The Jews divide the scriptures into three parts. Do you know what they are? Does anybody know what they are? The three parts of the Old Testament for Jews? The, the, the categories they put them in? First is Torah, and do you know what the Torah is? The first, four or five. the first five books. The first five books are the Torah, and Torah means law, so that's the first part. Do you know what the sec? Can you guess me what the second parts are? The second, the second one is the prophets. Prophets. Mm -hmm. So you have the law, the Torah. You have the prophets in Hebrew and the Navim. But the Torah, the law, the prophets, and then the third is called the writings. And so you'd put the, the first five books of Moses, that's Torah. Then you have all the prophets, and you know their names. We've studied a lot of them. Amos, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, all those. And then you have the writings, which are which include writings, um, writings which include the hist like the history books. Um, what, the ones we've been preaching on from David, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles. Those are writings, and then the Psalms are writings too. Psalms are considered writings; they're songs. And then you have, as a, the other part of writings, you have wisdom teaching, and the wisdom teaching are three books, or three collections of books. You've got the Proverbs, you have Ecclesiastes. And you have Job. And those are the three books of wisdom. And they're part of the writings. So that's what we're starting. And they're the most basic. The Proverbs are kind of the most basic. They're the starting point. 
for the books of wisdom. And some of them are attributed to Solomon, but they're all connected to this figure called the wisdom teacher. The, te the, the wisdom teacher. And sometimes wisdom even speaks itself. And wisdom, wisdom speaks in the first person. And we'll talk about that Sunday because I'm preaching on Proverbs 8. But there's there are moments, the wisdom teacher, and the wisdom teacher is always addressing his son. So the image is sort of King Solomon, who right, the legends say was the wisest, wisest man who ever lived, is passing on wisdom to his son. So that's kind of the the narrative backdrop is what you, what you imagine. You imagine a wise father giving his son advice on how to how to live and how to conduct himself and make good choices. And the two contrasting paths he's warning his son about is there's the path of wisdom and there's the path of foolishness. Right. And so, how do you stay on the path of wisdom and avoid foolishness. And so this is a cult Judaism is a culture that very much values education and learning. So that uses a few words that you should look for. Um, one is wisdom. Two is um, two is like intelligence or insight. And, and insight is kind of being able to see and perceive the reality underneath the surface. Right? So have wisdom, which is kind of the whole, the big picture. And then two is insight, be able to really see what's going on, right? You can see through the veil, you can see through the smoke screens, see through the BS, we might say, to, to the truth. Um, also discipline is a key word for Proverbs. Have discipline to study, right? And discipline, right? Discipline to stay on the path of wisdom, right? Uh, and that discipline, that's where we get the word disciple, right? And it means student. But there's there's this idea of, and Jews practice this; they always have that you discipline yourself to study. Right? Study should be a part of your life, and you should do it, right? Be faithful to it, stick to it, and it takes discipline. And then the last, um, the last, and this is this comes out as a key is a key to wisdom, is what you guys know might know the passage. The beginning of wisdom is what knowledge. fear of the Lord. No, knowledge, that's true. But I'm thinking, the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Have you heard that before? Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where wisdom has to start by fearing the Lord. You, you got to start by respecting the source of truth. Okay. If you don't, if you don't fear the Lord, you're not going to get started on the path of wisdom. Which is, I think, there's two, at least two things going on there. Why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? Well, one is that God is the truth. And the truth is God. God is the source of truth. And if there's no God, then you could be a relativist. Your truth, my truth, so-and-so's truth, everyone has their own truth, right? But that's not wisdom, according to the Bible. Wisdom is there is there is a truth, and that truth is comes from God. And it's not the case that anything can be true, and that you can have your truth and I can have mine. Okay, so there's th that's one reason why fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because it means that there is a truth that is not relative and not just subjective you can have your own and I can have mine does that make sense? Yes. and then I think the second reason why fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is because of humility right? you're never going to learn you're never, you can't learn unless you be, are willing to be taught right? that, that's, that's a problem that you, you encounter a lot I think today is that so many people think they know everything, right? And there's people, I've, I've had people in, in churches where, you know, they, they think they know better than me. I can't teach them, right? And maybe they do, I don't know. But either if their attitude is, you know, I know everything already, they're not going to be able to learn. There's an old, uh, there's an old, 
I think it's Japanese parable about the a Zen master and the Zen master gets a knock on his door and it's this young man who wants to come study with him and the young man says you know I, I want to learn from you I've I'm a good student I've already studied this I know this I know that so the master the Zen master sits down with the student and starts to pour tea he pours tea into his cup and then he begins to pour tea into the student's cup and he keeps pouring and, and the teacup fills the top and the master keeps pouring and pouring and pouring and the teacup starts to overflow out onto the table from the table onto the floor and the student says what are you doing can't you see the cups full no more will fit in and then the Zen master says that's right and that's what you're like you're full you're full of your own ideas yeah. you're full of your own opinions and no more is gonna fit in I can't teach you unless you empty your cup so again Fear of the Lord is part of that means humility to say, look, I respect that I'm not God and I don't know everything, right? So the fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom because it means there's a truth that is objective and not subject to opinion, and two, it means that we have to be humble because the Lord has the truth and we don't. All right, let's start. Uh, let's read the first few verses. Okay, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For attaining wisdom and discipline, I told you those were two key words, wisdom and discipline. For understanding words of insight, that's the other word I brought up. That's, so wisdom is kind of the whole picture of knowing right from wrong. Discipline is the ability to stay on the right path and the ability to just discipline and discipline meaning what you're doing you show up at Bible study right that's a discipline you come here you take the time you put in the work it's work to study isn't it I mean I think it's fun but it's still work so it takes discipline to learn and gain wisdom so attaining wisdom and discipline for understanding words of insight for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life doing what is right and just and fair for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Like even, right, even the wise need, need to keep learning. Nobody knows it all. And let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. So right, this is about the wise passing on their knowledge to the next generations. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline, right? Fools think, ah, I, who, I don't need to learn. I don't need to go to Bible study. I got this figured out, right? That, that's a, the fool despises wisdom and discipline, right? The fool thinks he knows already. The fool thinks he doesn't need to study, or she. Uh, I'm going to stop there. We're... We're close to the hour, so I hope everyone's enjoyed this. Um, let's see. Oh, we've had some more people join us. Hi to Shirley. Hi to hi Doris. Doris Bailey, that's Allie's mom. Welcome. I hope you've enjoyed being with us. I miss seeing you guys. And yeah, Linda says, oh, Aaron, can you turn up the volume a little? I don't really have a volume control on here. I think the microphone is just on or off. But sorry, I hope hope people could hear. Um, or you know what it might have been? The problem might have been that the heater was on. And that, that creates background noise that probably made me harder to hear. I'm sorry if you couldn't hear. Um, next week I'll try to turn the heater on when I come in the office so it's already warm and then turn it off once study starts. Um, sorry about that. I apologize. So I hope you can still get something out of it. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you next week. We'll, we're going to keep going through Proverbs. God bless everybody. Miss you guys.